Hello everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, first of all, thanks to you all for being here today in this very rainy North Carolina evening. We, will, uh, we would like to start by thanking the Romans Languages and Literatures Department and our chair Federico Visetti and uh, his assistant Logan Brackett, without whom uh, this event uh, could not have been possible. Uh, we also would like to thank the graduate students of the department that are here today and that, are, that, that helped us uh, organize this event. We would also like to thank the departments of Geography, Complete, and the Graduate Certificate in Cultural Studies for helping us promote today's event. Finally, we would also like to thank co the colleagues uh, at Duke, uh, Julia Rico and Elise Bongiotti and their Ocean Crossing Reading Group for advertising uh, this presentation. This is the first of, we hope, many events uh, organized to promote our new digital open access journal, the American Journal of Mediterranean Studies. Uh, the website www.aj-ms.org <laughs> is still under construction, but soon we will post our first call for papers and we will advertise our new initiatives there. Professor Westphal, that is here today, is a member of, the, of our prestigious advisory board uh, of the journal, uh, uh, members of which come from the most diverse academic backgrounds and from almost every continent. Bertrand Westphal is a professor of comparative literature at the University of Limoges, France, where he leads the research team, excuse my French, Espace Humain et Interaction Culturelle, Human Spaces and Cultural Interactions. He is a promoter of geocriticism, which Professor Robert Talley describes as, quote, a new critical practice suitable for understanding our special condition today, end of quote. Professor Westphal is the author of numerous works on geocriticism, Austrian literature, the Mediterranean, and the theory of the novel. His work is interdisciplinary, and he regularly collaborates with designers, architects, and geographers. In the past, he has taught in Italy at the Yule University and at the Milano Statale University. He is currently teaching at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, and will also be teaching there next year. Among his major publications, uh, there is Austrofictions, Une Géographie de l'Intime, uh, and then Geocriticism, Real and Fictional Spaces, translated by Robert Talley, uh, uh, in Italian, Geocritica, Reale Fizione Spazio, translated by Lorenzo Fabri, and uh, uh, the last, his latest uh, uh, publication is, um, uh, has been uh, very recently translated into English, and it's A Plausible World, translated by Amy Wells, and published by Palgrave Macmillan in December 2013. This, this book will be also published in Spanish <coughs> next year uh, with the name Un Mundo Plausible, translated by Domingo Pujante. Um, in the plausible world, the intersections of literature and cartography enable readers to understand this place is anything but purely geographic. A plausible world is created as a strategy to fill the void. Readers travel alongside navigators, pilgrims, literary characters, and artistic subjects as they experience the thrill of pure space through the exploration of the unknown. Here, political concerns such as the evolution in the orientation of maps, the establishment of meridians, and the naming of place in the image of the colonizer all play out across the imagining of space and its shaping into place. Innovative in his approach, Westphal challenges the view that perceptions and representations of space are stable or straightforward. Please join me welcoming Professor Bertrand Westphal. Well, thank you very much uh, for this very kind invitation. And uh, Miano, thank you for uh, your especially kind <laughs> presentation of my, you. of my works. Uh, so I'll speak, I don't know exactly how much time, my English is not absolutely great, so I was very shy at the very beginning, and I said, yeah, oh, maybe I took something like 30, 35 minutes. Now, maybe it will be quite a little bit longer, like 45 minutes, because I was getting less shy <laughs> as I was writing. <laughs> as for the result, it's up to you to decide, I wouldn't know. 
So, thank you. Uh, yeah, words making worlds. Um, slides, so it's making easier. Uh, when you think uh, about the phrase, uh, a phrase like uh, word making worlds, you will maybe remember the third lines of the Genesis, of course, which express uh, the biblical image of the universe. Uh, before the commencement, that's chapter 1, I don't know how it is in English, verse, verse, verse 2, verse two. Uh, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. And of the waters. But then God was said to have said, and yes, the world was made. Most uh, cosmogonies follow the same pattern. The geopoietic process, geopoietic means uh, creation of the world, uh, philological in, uh, in Greek. Uh, the geopoietic process relied on a few words, on some actions, which were supposed to make sense, or the other way around, by taking place, they made sense. All gods, including the Old Testamental one, were in a unique situation. They started the world from nothing, an absolute emptiness, far from any connotation. In some, there were gods. Well, but afterwards, what about man? I'm not sure that taking place remains the right formula in a human dimension, or the best formula, for all people acting after the very beginning of world history. Taking has often, or always, meant subtracting and place was often the result of this subtraction. Maybe it is better to keep a space open than to take place. According to me, Deleuze uh, and Guattari, the French philosophers, were the ones who expressed this idea best in some of their epochal nomadic writings of the 70s and the 80s. As I'm mentioning philosophers, let me quote another one, Wittgenstein, whose uh, Tractatus proposals are often great and enigmatic. What can be said at all can be said clearly, and what we can't talk about, we must pass over in, pass over in silence. You know it, it's really more than famous. All the places, what can be said clearly? All the spaces, what we can't talk about and what remains free and open to imagination? It probably would be of some interest to study the space-place relationship in the Genesis, for example. Cain had no map of the land of Nod before starting rendering east of Eden and before founding the first biblical town, Enoch, after his son's name. As soon as Enoch was established as a town, the first town, we may assume that a map was drawn. Also, there is no official mention of such a thing in the Bible. All cities got a name Right from the very start, as sons and daughters did. Names of places enter genealogy as well as people. This might already have sounded intriguing in ancient times. Toponymy isn't such a recent, a recent issue, indeed. Let's change course and head toward Ireland. As a matter of fact, one of the oldest strata of uh, Irish literature was dedicated to an inventory and an explanation of the first Gaelic toponyms. These laudable efforts nurtured a literary genre, various cycles of poems, the Dincian Cats. By the way, excuse my English, excuse my Gaelic, <laughs> excuse my French. 
literally, the, uh, literally, the word means laws of places. That's the Wikipedia definition basic. Uh, the Irish poet laureate John Montagu translates, translates it with place wisdom. One, uh, one, one more time, place and sense seem to be deeply connected. Also, the late Seamus Heaney mentioned the Dinseancas in some of his works. It is as if the world, is, if the world couldn't take abstractedness, anonymity, or silence. The first word to be pronounced after the genesiac, genesiac called moment was probably the name of a place. The only no-name city I know is the one which is depicted in Paint Your Wagon, 1969, a funny California said Western with an adorable uh, Gene Seberg, who was torn between two very tough guys, I don't know if you remember the movie, Lee Marvin and Clint Eastwood. Uh, in the so-called real world, there are always names. There, there is no no-name city. There must be names. But sometimes these names testify a hesitation. Have you ever heard of uncertain East Texas? 150 people live there and probably are wondering about something, <laughs> as we all do. After all, North Carolina is a stimulating wonderland. I show you. That's uncertain Texas. There is al already like a Louisiana Bayou. Um, it's a stimulating wonderland when you come from overseas, as I do. Even for Eden, North Carolina, and El Dorado, North Carolina, uh, the golden area isn't El Dorado, which is strange. It's, but you maybe know it very close to here. Uh, they don't mean meet all the expectations, mine at least, because yes, I checked on location. I was in Eden, and I was also in El Dorado. And there was no horse in Troy, North Carolina, but Carthage was just fine. <laughs> Some answers are out in the streets. Other ones are in books. They often appear to be intertwined. While I was preparing this lecture and some further projects, I read quite a lot of very captivating essays which had been published in different academic fields. Indeed, uh, when you're dealing with maps, places, spaces, you can't just be literary, or better say, stay literary. That would be too limited to ivory tower-like. And the ivory towers nowadays are not any anymore as fashionable as they were in romantic times. You also have to turn geographic, anthropologic, sociologic, etc. And then, to make it even wider, and I was about to add wider, you might think of on other forms of art, like the plastic ones, contemporary painting, installations, of course, but also performances, whatever creative work which has to be set in a physical place. Eventually, you have to be interdisciplinary. Space is everywhere, like time is. We are spatial temporal beings. We are living in and moving creatures. We are nomads, at least intellectually. Lawrence Buell, who is one of the major promoters of eco-criticism, which, as you all know, focuses on the connections between art and the natural environment, summarizes this in a striking uh, formula. There never was an is without a where. All right, then. But let's come back to the books I've just read. One of them was Italian, and had been written by Franco La Cecla, a renowned 
uh, anthropologist. The title was, still is, Perdersi Uomo Senza Ambiente, 1988, uh, which is uh, more or less, I don't know if it is translated in English, Getting Lost Man Without Environment. And he said that uh, La geografia del mondo non è un testo letterario con buona pace di semiotici e comparativisti. Sarebbero comparatisti, ma fa niente. Uh, ridurre il paesaggio a storie significa non essere capaci di toccarlo, di sentire l'irriducibilità della sua scala, uno a uno, la sua tangibilità, which more or less in English might be translated as you see there, the world, and that's an important one, uh, the world geography is not a literary text, the world geography is not a literary text which is too bad for the semioticians and the comparatists. Reducing a landscape to a story means that you are not able to feel the irreducibility of its one-to-one -one scale, its tangibility, duly acknowledged. Sorry for my comparative literature-minded approach, which seems to have nothing to do with the real world, the world of geographers and anthropologists, the world of serious people. Indeed. <laughs> In another of the books I read, I found uh, it was in English. It was uh, an American book. This one, uh, literature might be the wrong place to begin. Invoking words when looking at pictures is cheating. Yet Cindy Sherman's words was about Cindy Sherman uh, has consistently sidestepped photography, silent modality, and seduced viewers with murmur tales of their trappings. She's blonde. So, literature might be the wrong place to begin. But the author of those sentences, which are included in my 1980s and other essays, which came out last year, is Wayne Cosenbaum, who wrote some excellent biographies about Jackie Onassis, Andy Warhol, for instance, and lots of uh, other books. This man couldn't possibly demolish writers or scholars who were trying to interpret visual arts throughout the world. He truly champions the literary cause. As John McEnroe, one of my favorite American authors, said once during a tough, grassy field trip in Wimbledon, you cannot be serious. Actually, Cousin Bowes wasn't, wasn't, wasn't serious but expressed kind of a general feeling about the question. To shrink the story a bit, let's say that literature is not the best spot where you should start a topic about the world, the arts, and the maps. That's a matter reserved to true and serious experts of the real world, and as you know, we are never considered as such. Our field should be the study of dactyl hexameters in Callimachus and spondaic fifth feet in Homer. No offense, I totally agree, epic poetry is a great research ground. So let's pretend that the, buff the buffet is ready and let's have a drink. Okay, that's it. Or maybe not. <laughs> uh, or you just owe me some more minutes because you agree that literature has further options. Well, after all, why should literature have to tell us something about the world? Or oh, not directly, maybe, but through the study of how fiction is able to give a representation of the referential world, if we admit that such a one-sided model world exists. What's reality? I used to say, it is at least the wall where I prefer not to bang my head against. Okay, it definitely ought to be more than that, but this more than that can only be expressed through a series of words, so many meanings, lots of approximations, so much speech in any case. And one of them is deliberately fictional. It is the one that literature and other representational, representational arts offer us in a discreet manner, almost tiptoeing, 
And with an equal modesty, I will say, why, for goodness sake, wouldn't that be worthy and valuable? Why should Russia be the wrong place? Why should a story be incompatible with tangibility? Those are questions that are likely to arouse, arise every time literature goes out in the wide world, and especially in the world of space, of time, of an environment, either through a necocritical, a geopoetical, or a geocritical focus, and maybe other ones too. I do not think that arts need a defense council to enforce uh, their legitimacy and their impact on the world, but let's pretend they do just for a brief moment as a challenging mind game. What could arts bring, and among all of them, what could literature provide? Eco-criticism experts tackle such a question at the beginning of the 90s. Nature is something tangible, after all, and so does the literature that faces the environmental issues. In one of the first French books about eco-criticism, this one, Literature et Environnement, for an eco-critic comparée, two years ago, at last, Alain Subercico's position was a very interesting one. He stated that in the environmental field, literature might not be very effective because it won't help stopping the material depletion of the oikos, but it will nevertheless keep being indispensable for one very good reason, and I like it. The strength of an environmental-oriented literature will always result from the fact it takes into account issues of equity. Equity, 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 equity. Yes, which appears to be quite a threatened keyword on the surface of our ever more globalizing planet. Literature is no more bound to be a simple vehicle of some joliesse poetic, poetic prettiness, things of beauty, even if they remain a joy forever, a joy we desperately need as much as in Keats' times. But literature is no more circumscribed to the realm of aesthetics or to patterns of pure form, the ones the structuralist school explored in such a systematic way in defense of the textuality of the text. Literature has got to be part of an ethic issue. Once in 1996, in the introduction of a famous eco-criticism reader, Cheryl Glotfeldy wrote, literature does, no, does not float above the material world in some aesthetic ether, but rather plays a part in an immensely complex global system in which energy, matter, and ideas interact. I totally agree, and I repeat, it was still bold to affirm that 20 years ago, right after the structuralist school monopoly. As a supposedly weak means to improve our presence in the world, literature is well positioned to express what Super Chico calls an ethique de la dignité, ethique de la dignité, which is clearly understandable without the help of any translation. But arts do not only guarantee and provide some more dignity in a world where dematerialized materiality and empty globality often forget this fundamental dimension of the spirit. They also enable us to keep in touch with the flesh of our planet, its human effectiveness, or if we reduce the concept to just one world, it's humanity. Thus, they expand the planet in a way that has nothing to do with the deshumanizing, if not zombifying, ways 
um, of a computerized globalization. Art are quite down to earth, that's re uh, exactly the right word, which has abso absolutely nothing pejorative here. They are not floating above the material world as smiling to wing cherubs did once in Baroque paintings, when the scenery was beneath them, out of their reach, out of their concern. In such a context, the definition of what an author is turns out to be peculiarly important. What is an author indeed? An author is a person who explains and, in his or her own manner, expands the world, which is what he or she was supposed to do right from the very beginning of arts and literature. Is it a highly authority uh, thing to assume it? If you think so, you also have to admit that Romans were way more pretentious than we are now. The word author comes from auto. And the Latin auto was the one who was supposed to augere, to augment something he or she was in charge of. Authorship and augmentation were kind of synonymous. They implemented actio, action, eventually the author is the one who acts. In uh, 2003, Wayne Costenbaum, again, dedicated some beautiful pages to John Ashbery, which have been reproduced in the book I already mentioned. Uh, Ashbery is a famous New York school poet who was honored with piles of important prizes uh, for not uh, everybody knows him and his work. For instance, I have never heard his name before reading Cosenbo's book. Maybe because I'm French and because poetry isn't the best export product, which is a pity. Even my spell checker doesn't, but spell checkers usually are not very cultivated, also they read a lot. Uh, yet, I assume that Carsten Bohm was right when he wrote New York is more than Ashbery's poetry. The poet is an author. He helps formulating a place's reality by capturing and giving a striking representation. And representation always little further than reality. It is reality transposed at the human scale and adapted to a human syntax. In this regard, the author exercises a true uh, authorship, a considerable authority. Yes, New York, mega city, may be smaller than Ashbery's poetry, which still, according to Kostenbaum, provides the reader with a long, pointless walk, a perfect flaneur attitude, remember Benjamin, and by doing so extends the urban practitioner's range. Ashbury might be an apostle of going nowhere, but all the same, he brings you very far. These are true, I have quoted some eco-critical scholars, but let's also mention Kenneth White, the main promoter of geopoetics, who, uh, though being Scottish, usually writes in French. L'auteur, le poète, est celui qui essaye et qui parvient parfois d'augmenter la sensation du monde, which more or less sounds like the author of the, the poet is the one who tries and sometimes succeeds in creating the sensation of the world. During the uh, 2013 spring semester, I asked my students in Limoges, in a class about literature and environment, to comment this quotation. 
It probably was one of the most stimulating final exams I proposed to my students throughout the last years because it was a reflection about the core of our task as literary beings. The results of the exam were far from being bad. We all know how important it is to define our place in the world, not only as authors and poets, but also as literature students and scholars. Actually, Kellen White added something to the previous quotation. Ce qui compte, c'est de chercher, d'explorer. Explorer l'être, non pas définir un état. I.e., searching and exploring is what matters. To explore the being, not to define a state. That is what I call transgressivity in my own geopolitical approach, the fact that all appears to be continually moving on and that we only can catch a glimpse of reality for a short while, modestly, as the, as the flaneur we all are, volens nolens, whether we like it or not. I promise to talk about maps, and actually, that's what I'm doing without even mentioning maps. It's as if literature might be considered as a whole mapping process in what somebody called the cartographical term. Anyway, let's mention a name which is immediately associated to maps, Atlas. There's a very common mistake about who Atlas really was in the unreal and yet fascinating world of Greek mythology. When we refer to Mercator's very famous book, this one, <laughs> I won't try to read it completely, uh, which is usually called Atlas because even sadism has some boundaries. We suppose most of the time that the eponymous hero, Atlas, is a miserable titan whose job was to hold up the celestial sphere. Strength and passions were his main qualities. But there was another Atlas, who was a king of Mauritania, which corresponds to Northern Africa in today's geography. Here you have both of them. Nevertheless, the set is not crucial here. What is, what is, really, is that he used to be a philosopher and not a bodybuilder. <laughs> he was said to have built the first Elysian globe. The second Atlas's main quality was not no more physical strength, but intellectual insight, lucidity. He was the one Mercator was thinking of. Atlas, as an author of the world, was not a titanic muscle man, but a philosopher. The Fabrica Mundi is an intellectual and, above all, a human act. Feasible. I'll give you some more details about explicit maps in a few minutes, but let me first highlight another reason why literature is so useful to us, and of course to everybody outside the limited experts field. Uh, we are living in a world which is, or at least seems to be, filled up to the top edge. Is there any room left for fantasy? Here I usually recall an excerpt of Heart of Darkness, the one when Marlowe, the narrator of Joseph Conrad's novel, declares that he once saw how the last white patch of free land, blank on the map, vanished at the surface of the earth. What a strange feeling it must have been for Marlowe. Something happened to him that was exactly opposite to what happened to the Baroque man. Instead of being puzzled by a wide opening universe, he got disconcerted by the aver awareness that he had to face a shrinking one. In some way, he had to witness the end of mystery which also meant the fulfillment of modernity. 
a global knowledge, a total mastery of information, and a space, a space saturation that shouldn't have left much for new narratives. To be strictly accurate, I should add that Conrad wasn't completely right. Today, there is at last at least one last Terra Nullius left in a funny and stimulating book about cartography whose title is Maphead. Ken Jennings mentions it. It is Bir Tawil, which lays somewhere between Egypt and Sudan. That's, that's the last one. It doesn't belong to anybody. How come? The answer is both a question of trigonometry and of greediness and of paradox. If one of the two bordering countries, Egypt or Sudan, claimed the small triangle of Bir Tawil, it should stop to claim the bigger triangle of Halaib, which moreover has an opening on the Red Sea. I assume this is the only example where geometry even for interpreted in a non-Euclidean way is incompatible with nationalism. If you keep Birtawil, you have to let the other one, which is more important. So nobody claims it. Yet, Hirscher's adaptability is extraordinary, at least as much as the geometry is. Conrad's novel, to come back to Conrad, was originally published in 1899. If the last blank patch had been colored at the time, literature figured out new spaces which still were capable to host human adventures in an unknown world, or at least a non-saturated one. That's interesting, if you give a look at the dates. Now readers ought to enter the very cold one. Jules Verne, there, with Science de Glass, in English it is an Antarctic mystery. Uh, 1897, or a very remote for colonial, colonialist one, in uh, Emilio Sagales, in Siri de la Jungla Nera, uh, Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Book, so 1887, 1894, uh, or in Tarzan of the Apes, 1912 which are maybe the most famous ones, Edward Rice Bird, the, the last one, who also created The Princess of Mars, the first episode of the John Carter cycle, in the same year. The boom of science fiction was actually contemporaneous to Heart of Darkness. H.G. Wells presented The War of the Worlds in 1898, a year before Conrad's novel. The First Man in the Moon, 1901. Ice, jungle, and all kinds of outer worlds at the time, where the new blank spaces open to easy narration. We also have to keep in mind that Transylvanian Hills became a new home for vampires in 1897. If you're interested by the settings of the vampire stories over the 19th century, I suggest you to read, in Italian, uh, Franco Moretti who draw entire maps about all these uh, things. Atlas of the European novel eight, um, from the 19th century. Literature proposes an outcome whenever the world threatens to close in on, in on itself. Salgari, Verne, Kipling, Stoker, Wells, Riceboroughs, found out some rather predictable alternatives, albeit most of them were more than just new world designers, which anyway would have been enough, which, yeah, it would have been enough to make them canonical. And yet, they are canonical. According to Pierre Bayard, who became quite famous some years ago thanks to its essay on how to talk about books you haven't re re read, which was a bestseller. <laughs> really, we have the same editor. He says much more than I do. Uh, an important figure in this realm is Phileas Fogg, the main character of Verne's around uh, 
the world in 80 days, 1873. Apparently, the globe's surface may be completely drawn. That's what Marlowe noticed a quarter of a century after Phileas Fogg. For sure, you may be tempted to figure out new worlds to generate new tales. But even if the world was filled right to the brim, you should be able to take in charge the variety of representations which have something to do with it. You should have a general view, which was exactly what Phileas Fogg was looking for on his balloon. This is what Bayard writes about Verne's travelers in his following book, How to Talk About Places Where You Haven't Been. Maybe can go to places, no, no, not to read what you should read. Anyway, Baya is quite consistent. Uh, le fait que nous avons affaire en voyageant non pas à d'hypothétiques lieux réels, mais à des images subjectives arbitraires, prélevées sur un ensemble infini de représentations, ne rend que plus nécessaire la recherche de ce que j'ai appelé à propos des livres une vue d'ensemble. You have the English translation below. always in approximate translation mind. Like uh, Phineas Fogg, you probably have to take some distance from the surface of the heavens to be able to do so, to have a general view. It shows all art's place is somewhere in between the surface of the earth and the ether where you only could float without keeping any contact with the hypothetical real world. <clears throat> there is a very special place where arts are involved with tangibility. What about maps, then? I believe that all I have just said may be confirmed by an analysis of different kinds of mappings. The perfect map, in a positivistic view, should be fought on a one-to-one -one scale, the one Franco La Cecla is promoting. In other words, it would be the map where the model and its representation are absolutely equivalent. Same signs. What would happen if this would be achieved? Susan Sontag gives an idea of it in Death Kit her 1967 very postmodern novel, I quote her, I can slide, Didi has made his final chart, drawn up his last map, Didi has perceived the inventory of the world. The last map corresponds to the inventory of the world, one to one, to a certain extent. It is no accident that Sontag's novel finishes on this line. It's done. All set. What could you have? Nothing. In postmodernist time, in postmodern times, it appears that the central question is no more the vanishing of the last blank spot on the map, but the vanishing of the map itself. One to one, what a nightmare. Yet this nightmarish ideal, like most ideals, is fortunate, fortunately unachievable. I invite you to read or reread because it's a classic, Jorge Luis Borges' short story on exactitude in science. You know. Where a college of cartographers plans to conceive in the perfect map of an empire on the scale to, yeah, uh, on a mile to mile scale. Practically, the project fails. Because as soon as the map is about to be made, it starts disintegrating. As if an excess of abstract location was doomed to material dislocation. What was left? Not much. If you, in the deserts of the West, still today, there are cattle ruins of that map, inhabited by animals and beggars in all the land there is no other relic of the disciplines of geography. Eventually, the map was of some help, 
but good clothes uh, would have been far more useful to the poor subjects of the empire, I guess. Borges's short story embodies an extreme hypothesis, of course, yet to some extent all Mappe Mundi fail in the same way. The universe is moving, the planet is evolving, and the maps only can give a glimpse of it, which is destined, destined to fade out, and which anyway never is and, is and then was accurate. All cartographic achievements are biased because they express a point of view. The, they are de determined by their floating nature. The absolute point of view, the perfectly neutral one, which should be the conditio sine qua, uh, sine qua non uh, to objectivity, is not less a fable than the one to one scale. Mercator's projection and his atlas were considered unquestionable for almost four centuries by most people. Yet, they expressed the world view of the Western colonial powers. No, Africa is not smaller than <coughs> Russia, if you look at Mercator's maps, and India is definitely bigger than the Scandinavian peninsula up to three times bigger. Yet, yet, <laughs> you had to wait for Arno Peters' uh, 1974 world map to have a major reaction against Mercator's still overwhelming global image. And there was a, a real battle uh, among geographers because that was absolutely scandalous in 1974. Not 1874, 1974. Because it's okay, it's okay. As a matter of fact, it is worthy to point out that Peters was not a geographer but an historian. As for uh, James Gall, who was the first promoter of this non distorting or less distorting projection during the second half of the 19th century, he was a Scottish clergyman. Mundi once weren't supposed to be accurate. By contrast, they had to be appropriate. As Guillaume Mont-Saint-Jean writes in Mapamundi Art, uh, it's in French, <laughs> excuse my French, Art et Cartographie, a very recent book last year, about the topic we are dealing with, they had to fit within the ongoing pattern of a philosophia mundi. There was a connection between fabrica mundi and philosophia mundi. Let's go back some centuries ago. You probably know the Hereford Mappa Mundi dating uh, around uh, 1285. If not, you can go and watch it inside the Hillfall Cathedral in England, close to Wales. It's a perfect example of this approach which mixes up representatio and philosophia. Uh, right here. As most maps at the time was oriented, oriented. That's the reason why we are oriented eastward. Uh, e is eastward, but E is also Eden. Uh, in the middle of Jerusalem, uh, and in some other maps at the time, you had the Corpus Christi, the hands, the feet of Jesus Christ on the maps, uh, etc. So it was obviously a mix up of. Uh, more or less abstract and more concrete elements because there was no absolute difference uh, between Philosophia and the Fabrica uh, Mundi. In other words, has it become possible to draw a clear line 
between objectivity and subjectivity, because today, of course, that wouldn't be appropriate anymore. It wouldn't be objective. I guess not. Even the very objective like Google Earth, that's quite opposite. Here and Google Earth. Uh, even the very objective like Google Earth is quite suspect within this framework. Ken Jennings reports that Brian McClendon, the inventor of the application, figured out a world center which was located in Lawrence, Kansas, in a precise street and in a precise lot of houses, the Meadowbrook Apartments. If you're there, you're in this world center. <laughs> Here. For goodness sake, why should the fourth city of Kansas be the home for the navel of the world? <laughs> because, as Jennings writes, it was a salute to McClendon who grew up in that very building. <laughs> home for egocentrism, you know. Uh, it was a joke. McClendon's joke. Funny man. And <laughs> since then, it had been corrected, unfortunately. Uh, but all map makers don't have this keen sense of humor. Borges' imperial or imperialist cartographers are probably still active. All this is heading to one single direction. If maps become arguable, it means that maps must be considered as frameworks for narration, among other narrations. That is undeniably why they have been elevated to the status of major literary themes and metaphors, not to mention all the mappings in contemporary art. This occurred to such an extent that we really are legitimate to consider that a cartographical term took place, one which has to be connected to the spatial term which started in the 70s. It would be way too long to develop the topic further here, and especially in the almost infinite realm of visual arts. I just would like to show you some examples on which I have been working for the past two years. One is Berger and Berger, two brothers, Astre Blanc. So I, I wrote some papers about these, uh, the works I show you, um, I haven't de developed, as will be very long. So this one. Another one is uh, George Deem's Vermeer's Maps. Vermeer is in interesting painter anyway, but also interesting because it draws a lot about maps. There are six or seven uh, paintings with maps in Vermeer, and other ones with a globe, uh, you know them, the geographer, the astronomer. And George Dean, an American painter, uh, parodies or parodied many, many paintings by Vermeer, an obsession. I would appreciate I wouldn't appreciate to forget maps, a floor work which had been installed uh, by Mona Hatoum in 1980, uh, 1998. This one. That's a great one. A world map made with marbles, glass marbles, on a floor. When people visited the exhibition, the marbles started to move. And that's exactly the image of the world. It's also an image. I commented this uh, installation with uh, my students, and one of them had a, had a very good idea. It's also an image of diasporas. It's not only the world, the abstract world, which is like the, the image which is moving, but also people is moving, like marbles in an instable world. Uh, Hatoum is really one of the top artists of this topic. So they're both marbles? So yeah, yeah, the same one two different uh, pictures of the same uh, work. But uh, as for Hatoum, you might find uh, uh, 20, 30 interesting works about different kinds of maps. So Hatoum. 
uh, one last uh, one uh, Italian, uh, Michelangelo Pistoletto, who is one of the most famous contemporary uh, artists in Italy, uh, from Biella, and uh, who drew, no, he didn't draw, yeah, he also drew, the, but at least he, he made a map of the Mediterranean <coughs> as a table open to people. <coughs> people should sit down around the table, and this table is the Mediterranean. As you know, the Mediterranean is not exactly the most easy place in the world, and it's not the place where everybody sits down without any comment and nothing. So, as a great work. The question is, is there a fundamental, and I'm about to finish, uh, is there a fundamental difference between these artistic globes and maps and the one we see in geographical textbooks? They give us a lecture about the way, or better say, the plural ways we might perceive the world. They give us a possible image of the world, and who knows, maybe even a plausible one. Literature and visual arts are always channels for a philosophia mundi. They are honest and very humble too, because they recognize that they are subjective. Is there a mundus without philosophia? According to Bernard Lassu, one of the leading French landscape architects, literality means leaving places as they are in a way that totally respects all their possibilities. He respects their possibilities. End of the quotation. As a matter of fact, such an approach deeply respects places and environments. What would literarity, literaturnost, literarity, mean then? Literality, literality. The fact, I guess, to express and to map some of the possibilities. Possible. And at the same time, to keep all the other ones open, because there is no such thing as a global map, an all-inclusive map. Edouard Glissant formulates this principle much better than I would be able to do. La démesure du monde est explorable par la démesure du texte. The world's excess may be explored through the text excess. In French, it's better because mesure, démesure. Measure, this measure, but it doesn't exist, I guess. The world is outrageous, beyond measure. Our maps, beyond measure, the traditional ones aren't exactly. They just give a wrong measure or partial one, inevitably, because every singular measure is doomed to be a partial one. Maps are monological. They convey their own truth. Maps are cold. Did you notice that the north orientation of modern maps points out the icy emptiness of the pole? Let's help making it a little warmer. Let's back up Virgin Berger, Dim, Atum, Pistoletto, and hundreds of other ones. All around the world were dearer to express the countless lines, creases, and wrinkles which characterize our very old planet and our so various inhabitants. So yes, we are not able to feel the irreducibility of a one-to-one -one scale, as Franco Lachekla reproached us, but assume this has to be put on our credit, because by doing so, we actually increase our tangibility. By the way, Bacheka's book is a truly excellent one. For instance, it mentions a Hungarian joke about two alpinists who get lost in the middle of some mountains. One of them has a map. He pulls it out of his rucksack and takes a look. After a while, he raises his head and tells his mate, we are on the mountain over there. <laughs> they, go, they got lost, but
But maybe they discovered the very puzzling essence of literature. As for us, here we stop. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>